Hi, Year 6. Mrs Withers here with Chapter 24 of Room 13. Where the heck have you been? We've been waiting ages. Fliss had emerged, blinking against the sudden glare, on a narrow street at the back of the building. Gemma, Grant and Gary, keen to move on to the next thing, gazed reproachfully at her. Sorry, I got lost. Lost? sneered Gemma. How could you get lost in a tunnel, for goodness sake? You walk through it and that's it. And you're miles in front of us, put in Grant. We expected to find you waiting here when we got out. Gary grinned. You shot off up that tunnel in, the, in a heck of a hurry, Fliss, for someone who's not chicken, I mean. Chicken's got nothing to do with it. It was that moving floor. It was like a dream I had, a nightmare. My feet taking me where I didn't want to go. And then there was this hole in the wall and I went through and I was behind the tunnel. It was pitch black. I kept bumping into stuff. Rubbish in that. I thought I'd never find my way out. You're a nut, said Grant. I never saw any hole. And if I had, I wouldn't have gone through. Anyway, where are we going next? Amusements? Gary shook his head. Not me. I don't like fruit machines. You lose all your money. I'm off to the shops. Me too, said Fliss. She needed to talk to Gary, away from the other two. Well, I'm going with Grant, said Gemma. I won two pounds for ten pence on a machine last year at Blackpool. When Grant and Gemma had gone, Fliss said, I've got something to tell you, Gary. What? They were back on the seafront heading for the gift shops. Gary was walking fast. Slow down a bit and I'll tell you. It's not the flipping Olympics, you know. Gary stopped. Go on then, what? She told him about Sal Hagerlife and what the old woman had said. When she told him about the promise she'd made, he said, she said, will you help me, Gary? I don't think I'd attempt it by myself. Gary pulled a face. I guess so. I mean, we've been together all the way along, haven't we? Trot and Lisa too. I just don't know what it is we're supposed to do, Fliss. She said we'd be told. Yeah, but she's balmy, isn't she? If I hadn't seen all that weird stuff with my own eyes, I wouldn't believe a word she said. But you have seen it. Old Sal might be mad, Gary, but she knows all about the crow's nest. Hmm. Well, we'll just have to wait and see if we're told, won't we? If not, I don't see how we can do anything except keep Ellie May from going in that cupboard. They stopped. Fliss brought a brown photo mounted on the on a block for her parents. It was by somebody called Sutcliffe, who lived a long time ago and was a famous photographer. It showed two young children playing with a toy boat. She'd seen what she'd seen one like it, but bigger, on the wall in the crow's nest. Gary found a leather key fob with the Abbey and the word Whitby embossed on it for his dad, and a little vase encrusted with seashells for his mum. By the time they'd decided on these purchases, it was half past two. They were due to meet the teachers back at the bandstand at three, so they made their way in the direction and spent the last 20 minutes in the lifeboat museum. Some of the others were there too, and they compared presents and donated their last few pennies to the lifeboats. At three, Fliss, Gary and the others left the museum and crossed the road to the bandstand, where the teachers were waiting. Nearly everybody was there. The twins weren't, and neither was Trot. Everybody sat down except Mrs Evans, who stood gazing along the seafront and looking at her watch. The twins turned up. Mrs Evans frowned at them. What time were we to meet? she asked. Three o'clock, miss, murmured Joanne. And what time is it now? Joanne. Miss, eight minutes past. We were on the donkeys, miss. Mm. It was almost a quarter past three when Trot came trudging up the slipway from the beach. He was carrying a torn plastic kite and looked set up. And where have you been, David Trotter? Do you know what time it is? Yes, miss. Sorry, miss. I was trying to mend my kite. Mrs Evans looked at the kite. It was made of clear polythene on a rigid, plas rigid plastic frame. It had a picture of a bat on it, but the polythene was badly torn and hung in tatters from its frame. She sighed. What was the last thing I said before we went off to do our shopping, David? I don't know, miss. No, because you weren't listening. 
I warned everybody not to spend money on cheap, rubbishy goods, David. How much was that kite? £1.40, miss. £1.40. And look at it. Didn't you notice how thin that polythene was? Didn't you realise that the first good gust of wind would rip it to pieces? No, miss. No, miss. Well, it did, didn't it? She turned to the group. You know, sometimes I wonder whether the other teachers and myself aren't just wasting our breath talking to you people. First, there was Lisa Watmer going into a shop before we even got here, buying a trashy, flashy light, which is probably broken already. Then, Gary Bazard spends I don't know how much on a stick of rock the size of a telegraph pole. Her eyes found Gary, who looked surprised. Oh, yes, Gary, I know all about that rock. It's in your room now, melting, with a beard of bed fluff on it. You've sucked it, you've sucked at it till you're sick of it, and now you don't know what to do with it. She looked at Trot again. And now, you, with your kite. I only hope that next time, if there is a next time, you'll be told. You'll be told? Fliss, whose mind had been wandering, looked up sharply. Mrs. What was Mrs. Evans talking about? Buying things. Things she shouldn't. Lisa. Gary. Trot. Why those three? It's a connection, isn't it? It must be. It can't be a coincidence, can it? Her heart kicked in. You'll be told. Yeah, but hold on a minute. What about me? I'm one of them. I started it. In fact, I haven't been in trouble for buying anything. I've been late for breakfast, but that's different. Nobody said to me, you shouldn't have bought that. It's rubbish. Nobody's... The pebble. The big pebble. I didn't buy it, of course. But Mrs Evans told me to put it down. Um, it's a thing, like a torch or a stick of rock or a kite. That's it. The four of us. Nobody else been getting told off for something they've got, have they? She sat, frowning, gnawing at her lip. A torch, a stick of rock, a pebble, a kite. You'll be told. Chapter 25 they were back at the crow's nest by twenty to four, stowing their purchases in their rooms and writing up their journals. It had been their last day, and Fliss wondered why it had been it had to end so early. It wasn't as if they'd be setting off home at the crack of dawn and needed an early night. They weren't leaving till half past ten. Not that an early night would be much use to the four of us anyway, she thought. She had talked briefly to Lisa and Trot on the stairway. They knew what had happened to her today and had agreed to meet Gary and herself in the usual spot at half past eleven. The rest of the kids were feeling a bit down because the holiday was nearly over, but for Fliss, Gary, Lisa and Trot it couldn't end soon enough. They were tired and frightened and wanted only to be near their parents and to sleep in their own beds. Guess what? said Marie. She was looking out of the window. Shut up, Marie, growled Maureen. I'm trying to write. The old witch is there again, said Marie, ignoring her. We know, said Joanne impatiently. We saw her when we came past the shelter just now. How do you spell steak, Fliss? Fliss looked up. There's two sorts of steak, she said. What are you writing about? A poster I saw in the town. Movie poster. It showed this vampire with a steak through its heart. It said, party all night, sleep all day, never grow old, never die. It's fun being a vampire. That's the sort of steak, Fliss told her. Oh, that sort of steak, S-T-A-K-E, Fliss told her. Thanks. Joanne bent her head over her work. Marie left the window, sat down at the dressing table and began to write. Silence reigned. Fliss chewed her pencil and stared at the carpet. S-T-A-K-E. Stake. A short pole sharpened at one end and a mallet to hammer it in with. A flaming torch to illuminate the crypt and a cross lest the vampire should wake. A stick of rock the size of a telegraph pole stuck to a point. A pebble too heavy for the pocket. A torch the shape of a dragon. A cross. No cross. Trot. We've each done our bit except trot. 
Crop must find the cross then. He hasn't got one that I've ever seen. He didn't buy one today, which was the last chance he bought a kite. That tattered kite on its rigid, rigid cross-shaped frame. That's it. She was certain now. You'll be told. Sal Hagalife had said, and it was true, Mrs Evans had catalogued the items and then spoken those very words. You'll be told. The pieces fitted. Every one. She got up and went to the window. Sal was sitting in the shelter and seemed to be looking at her. Fliss mouthed a silent, yes, and nodded. The woman made no response. But then the sun was behind the hotel and and this side was in a shadow. When they went down to the lounge, the children found out they'd be they'd returned early to the hotel. There was to be a disco for them in the dining room starting at seven o'clock. They would eat early so that the room could be prepared and would have plenty of time to wash, do their hair and get into their best outfits before the festivities began. It's a farewell disco, Mr Hepworth told them. Farewell to the crow's nest. Farewell to Whitby. We've kept it a secret until now because we wanted it to be a surprise. It will go on until half past nine with a break at eight o'clock for pop, crisps and various other goodies. Mr and Mrs Wilkinson's daughter will be running the disco and I think it's very kind of them all. Don't you? Everybody did. There were three very loud cheers for the Wilkinsons. One came to the door, um, who came to the door, doorway of the lounge to hear them and then it was dinner time as she ate flish watched ellie may two tables away she joined them on the trip to robin hood's bay that morning and had seemed fine she behaved so normally that at one point flish had approached her and spoken just to see what she'd do ellie may had been her usual rude self telling Fl Fliss to drop dead and she seemed normal now too sitting between tara and michelle boasting about the outfit she was going to wear. She's chuffed to little mint balls, though, um, thought Fliss, looking forward to the disco like everybody else. She doesn't remember a thing about last night, or the night before, or the night before that. Lucky her.